Welcome to the All For Your Life podcast, where you can write a new script for your life and become the hero of your story. I'm your host, David McRae. You are the author of your life. Let's get started. All you have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to you. In my experience, there's no such thing as luck. It is not our abilities that show what we truly are. It is our choices. Before we launch into the podcast, I'd like to tell you about my book, All For Your Life, Become the Hero of Your Story. This is a book for people who are at a crossroads in life and want to make a fresh start. Judging by the fact that you're listening to this podcast, I suspect that you may well be one of those people. This book is going to help you to change your narrative and rewrite the scripts in life that are holding you back. This book covers the latest science and research showing you how to become the person you want to be and live the life that you want to live. I'd like to invite you to get this book, not only because I feel it's a great book that's going to help you, but also it's going to support the podcast as well. I love podcasts, but sometimes all of those ads that you get can be really irrelevant and annoying when you just want to listen to a good piece of training or a good interview. So I therefore made the decision with my podcasts that number one, I wanted my podcast to be free so that everyone could listen to it. And number two, that I wasn't going to fund it through all these annoying and irrelevant adverts and commercials. Therefore, if you want to support the podcast and support all the things I put out there for free, whether it be here on the podcast, my YouTube channel, other areas on social media, then buying a book is going to enable and help that process. So this is what we call a win-win scenario. By buying the book, you help to support my work and all the free stuff that I put out there. And you also get a really transformational book that's going to help you make those changes that you really want in your life. So if you feel you're someone who's at that crossroads in life, you're looking for a new direction, you're looking for a fresh start, then make sure you get this book. Author Your Life, Become the Hero of Your Story is available on Amazon in ebook, paperback and audiobook. Whatever your preferred medium, it's there for you to go get right now. Hello, Story Changers, and welcome back to the All For Your Life podcast. Today on the podcast, we have Alyssa Liahi. At age 39, while navigating an unexpected divorce, Alyssa was diagnosed with breast cancer and thyroid cancer. Rebuilding physically, emotionally, and financially took more courage than she thought possible. Yet today, she is surviving and thriving by helping others reconnect with their inner warrior, artist, and exhibitionist. Alyssa is the creative force behind Tatubi, which is temporary body art for breast cancer survivors, and Topless Goddess, which is mentorship for reclamation and change. In our interview today, you will learn that beauty is how you define it, To learn to accept your challenges rather than fight them. That you can create your way out of your problems. And that cancer is a gift. You'll learn this and so much more with Alyssa Liahi. Alyssa, welcome to the Author Your Life podcast. Hi, thank you, David. Well, Alyssa, you have a very interesting Uh, business and an interesting passion and projects that you're working on and I'm really looking forward to getting into a little bit more about what this is all about what your your story and your journey is into doing the work that you do Uh, so this is how I'd really like to start things off today and start off our conversation is you have a business called Tattoo can you Mm -hmm. tell us where this business came from and, and why you started it uh, absolutely. Yeah, the name <clears throat> doesn't really lend to what it is. The name is a combination of tattoo and booby, right? How do those things go together? Um, so, surgeries <clears throat> and it left me feeling scarred and maybe a little bit Frankenstein, disfigured, and threatened to 
take away my sensuality or my, my beauty as a woman. So in the process of going through treatment and all that that entailed, and then in the process of transitioning into survivorship and wanting to reclaim creative control and reclaim what was almost taken away, I decided to start designing temporary body art for my breasts and for my scars. So a lot of breast cancer survivors, and this is what really inspired it, a lot of breast cancer survivors will get mastectomy tattoos or permanent tattooing over their scars, something that symbolizes their story, their journey, their strength. And it's a way of taking back personal control and a way to celebrate um, your story as something that empowers versus something that feels like um, something that was just traumatic. So as I was going through my journey, I collected many, many, many designs of different tattoos I might want to get. And there were just too many. I didn't want to settle on one design. And I also have a certain reverence for my scars and everything that I've been through. So I started designing temporary tattoos that are especially designed to cover the scars and to frame the breasts in a way that creates an illusion of a matching set. And it takes me from sort of crying and hiding to sharing and celebrating and honestly even drawing out a bit of an exhibitionist in me. So it's a real role reversal, a real transformation. And I had so much fun with it that I started making a lot of them and I created a business. So we, we give them away um, all the time at different breast cancer events. And then we have them um, for purchase because there are many caregivers, friends and family of breast cancer patients that want to do something to inspire hope in their journey. And it's just a great symbol of all is not lost. There's always creative control. There's always light at the end of the tunnel. And, um, and we define beautiful for ourselves. So that's tattoo B. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I love that, um, that last line, define beautiful for ourselves. Mm. Uh, this is an interesting conversation for me because as a man, I just can't relate to this at all. I don't know anything about this, this sort of experience. You know, us men, we have breasts, but they're flipping useless. Uh, they, they, don't, <laughs> they don't do anything. They're not a, a symbol of our sexuality. They they have no kind of link with our identity. They have no biological function in terms of the maternal caregiving. Like as, as a man, I just, I can fully understand and appreciate the difficulties and the challenges that a woman will go through when something like this happens to her. Would you mind explaining for my thick male skull and any other thick male <laughs> skulls that, that might be listening to this, what does, a mastectomy mean what happens what do you lose when you lose your breasts yeah well i just want to take a small moment to acknowledge the men because men can also get breast cancer mm -hmm. and so i don't want to leave them out of the equation so just a note and a nod to um, the many brave men that have also been on this journey although it may not have the same um, impact in terms of sensuality it's mm -hmm. still a courageous fight that they that they move through so you know when we get this breast cancer diagnosis it's it's so treatable so it's something that we're going to go through and it's something that we, we had so many choices, right? And fortunately there's a lot of good information now in the medical world and women are being more and more empowered to make a choice that's right for them. So they might have a surgery to remove just the cancer or just the tumor. 
they might remove a single breast and then use a prosthetic and or they may choose to do a bilateral mastectomy and from there they may choose to retain if they can um, the nipple tissue or they may decide like in my case um, that that wasn't worth the risk because that is still a potential for um, developing breast cancer down the road so, and in my case, the cancer was very close to that area, so it wasn't really an option anyway. So, you know, the things that I hear from women and from the people that I work with are everything from, oh, I'm, I'm 65 years old, I'm, well, it doesn't matter, it's fine, I used them, they fed my babies, it's great, you know, it's not a problem, to women in to women that say it's a, it's okay no one has to see it but me and they suffer in secrecy and they say it's okay but it's not they've just decided to cover that part of themselves and um to sort of work around and in my case it was not only losing my breasts my self-worth was already hanging by a thread because I was going through a really unexpected divorce. So the identity crisis was already in full swing. I was learning how to be a single mom. I was turning 40, which felt like 90. I was wondering if I would ever be desirable again. Would I even have time for that? And then I lost my breasts, I lost my hair, and I went through a treatment that I thought would really advance my age and drop my energy level and enthusiasm. And it felt like a lot was really on the line. So I got to a place of, for lack of a better phrase, just, oh, hell no, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, hell no. It was so <laughs> much. It was so much that it really made me face what might have been a rock bottom, but I didn't find a bottom. I found sort of a trampoline. I found an inner resiliency and this little fighter that just wouldn't give up. And I didn't have control over my treatment journey. I didn't have control over so many things, but I had creative control, always creative control. So you know, using body paint over my scars, using humor, spending my time with inspiring artistic people, with women that celebrate their bodies no matter the shape and size. And I just refused to buy into the idea of, um, I, I don't necessarily like to, you know, put blame outside in terms of society and, and all of that. I don't feel victim to that either. But whatever idea I had in my head of what would be beautiful and desirable, I just, I, I let it be shattered and I reinvented it. And it's, my life has been exponentially more fun and celebratory ever since. And then to be able to light that fire with other women, other warriors, to encourage them to take their tops off, right? <laughs> to look at their scars, to look inside themselves, to love themselves, and then to go so far as to decorate and celebrate themselves. It's been a, a lot of fun. You mentioned there, there was this shift that you had to make in your identity and how you defined yourself. What do you feel that shift was that you made? It was a shift from looking at external measures to taking control and being my own measure of self-worth and beauty. And it pulled a lot on my faith and spirituality because, you know, this is what I say to my daughters. Um, even before this journey, I would say to my young daughters, nature is an artist and every last freckle on your face is meant to be there. It's there on purpose. And people come in all shapes and sizes. 
And I would say these things and sing these sweet songs to them. And yet what I realized I was doing was holding myself up against an ideal of what I thought a man would find desirable or um, some previous conditioning to being small and sweet and not being powerful or creative or bold. And, um, you know, nature made natural breasts, but also, you know, I didn't invent cancer and cancer wasn't my fault. And so nature or no, that was something out of my control. So I just realized it just doesn't matter. It's something that comes from within. Uh So I started practicing what I was preaching to my daughters. Mm -hmm. You have a a very interesting perspective on cancer that I'd like to, to talk a little bit more about. And it's, it's, a perspective that I've got a very, a very similar perspective on. You talk about seeing cancer as a blessing and a gift. And I'm sure there's not too many people in the world who, who see it that way. Uh, could you speak a little bit more about why you have this perspective on what so many people consider to be the ultimate doom and the, the dreaded C <laughs> words that nobody wants to hear? Uh, where does this perspective come from for you? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you know, I just, I watch myself whenever I'm in a story of victim and villain because it doesn't align with my faith and my belief in a benevolent universe. And it, with my divorce, it didn't serve me to tell a story of victim and villain. And so with the cancer, you know, it, it, both of them were just catalysts for me to awaken to my inherent worthiness. And when I got the blessing diagnosis, the cancer diagnosis, I, I felt as if it was something that manifested as a result of living with a broken heart. And by that, I mean, not living in my not living in full understanding of the being and the beauty that I am and, and the, my full potential, my full creative expression. And whether that be in a relationship where I was codependent or whether that be um, not expressing my full joy for fear of being seen or being embarrassed or what think thinking too much about what other people might think. Um, and so, especially because it was breast cancer and it was right here at my heart, it felt like a cry from my body and from my soul and my lifestyle to be heard and seen and loved and healed and so that's the journey that I went on. I, I didn't feel that, and the organizations that are doing, you know, F cancer and kick cancer's ass and all that are doing really, really good work. It just so happens that those phrases didn't resonate with me. Yeah. I, I didn't, it wasn't going to be me against cancer. It was going to be an all inclusive journey of love and healing. And, and that's why I call it the blessing diagnosis. Yeah. This is a a really interesting way of, of looking at things because in some ways I too see cancer as a blessing and a gift out of out of all the illnesses that you can have and out of all the, the means of of death that there are. Cancer in some ways has some advantages over other ways of dying and, and other ways of being ill. I can't speak to what it's like to experience cancer and, and have a diagnosis of cancer, which, which you have. All I can speak about is having seen people um, experience cancer. I've, I've lost two people to cancer. I lost my, my dad four years ago, and I lost my stepdad two years ago. And for each of them, I'm actually really glad that they died of cancer and not of anything else, because there's one thing that cancer gives you, which I'm incredibly grateful for in each of these instances is 
if it's a terminal diagnosis, it gives you a timeline. You know that they're going to die, but you know that you have a certain amount of time left with them. And, and in the case of, of both of them, with my dad and my stepdad, I had an opportunity to get some closure with them, to say goodbye to them, to have a final moment with, with each of them, actually. Um, I, got, I got kind of like a, a last 60 minutes with both of them. I was actually with my dad for the final 60 minutes of his life, and I got um, 60 minutes with my stepdad a couple of weeks before he passed away. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. And I'm so grateful that cancer gave me the opportunity to bring both of those relationships to a close. You know, they could have been hit by a bus one day and I would have never got to say goodbye to them, never tell them how grateful I was, never say what I really felt about them and how they really meant to me. And that can sound like a very odd thing to say to someone who hasn't been through that experience, either losing a loved one or, or experiencing um, cancer yourself. But if we're looking at all the different illnesses that can kind of grab us, I don't know, cancer seems in a weird way to make a bit more sense and have a bit more meaning than any of the other ones. Yes, yes. And thank you for sharing that with me. Um, you're right. It's, there's a mercy to it in a lot of ways. And I feel what you're speaking to is the perspective to get the perspective of what's truly important and then the opportunity <clears throat> to make a shift and act in a way that is aligned with this higher perspective of what really matters. Yeah. 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 So we set everything aside and I assure you the way that I speak to my daughters is different. The way that I interact mm -hmm. in the world is different. And I don't know that you need to, you know, when people say that they, they haven't had it themselves, I think when you receive the diagnosis for yourself, you might not know until that moment what your choices may be around your treatment journey. There's so many different ways people handle that. And I think you have to get the diagnosis for yourself to know what you might do around that. But in terms of gaining this perspective that you're talking about, it, it doesn't have to be something, it, it did happen to you directly. Um, in terms of you realize you had that moment of realizing the gift yeah and and then you had the opportunity to speak to it and and have that exchange with them and that's beautiful and to live in it a whole life from that place of knowing what's truly important and not taking things for granted that's it's a gift it's a yeah. gift yeah absolutely uh, i like to focus a little bit more on your journey and, and your experience, you're on the other side now and you've taken all of this perspective and, and lessons and I can also sense that there's a real purpose that has come out of it. You're, you're clearer on who you are and who you want to be and what you want to do in the world. But looking at that journey a little bit more, um, as we're saying, you've, you've gone through the experience, you've gone through the treatment, you've, you've gone through the the pains and struggles that are associated with it. Um, and you're, you're speaking a little bit earlier about your attitudes towards how you're going to approach this. And I think it's, it's great to pick your attitude at the start, but that can very quickly change once the, the reality of, of what's about <laughs> to happen sets in. You can say, I'm going to beat this. And then suddenly things don't look so rosy and you don't have that same confidence or that belief. How did you manage to stay strong and stay motivated throughout the whole process and see it through and manage to get yourself to the other side? Yes, you're right. There are these moments of <laughs> being a total warrior, right? And I'm going to handle anything. And the, the farther you get into the journey, the more you know what there is to be afraid of. And so it's each, you know, I had six surgeries and each one was harder to go into because I knew what I was getting myself into. Um, I had an infection at one point. I was, there were all sorts of complications. When I learned I was going to have to have the chemo, that was a moment of real anger and um, 
frustration because I thought I had a hold on the situation until that point, right? I was negotiating and making compromises. Oh, I'll just have this surgery and then it's, it's, it'll be fine. And then this and then that. And it doesn't really transform you unless you hit that moment of, oh, I really don't have any control here. I really, I really don't have any control. So I, it's a little bit of the only way to the other side is through, I forget what that expression is, the, but we don't, we don't have control. And so I did go through a lot of things that were really hard and I didn't feel really very strong at all, but it, it wasn't a journey of being happy or strong. It was a journey of surrender really. And it was a journey to now I'm angry I'm going to be angry and I'm going to explore the anger. Now I'm in physical pain. Now I'm afraid. And yeah, I mean, I got really, really sick. And there were moments where I just thought, why would I, why would I even want to be here if this is what this is going to feel like? And I, there's no certainty on the other side. And, um, and so but that was all part of the transformation. It wasn't about trying to skate over it. It was about really diving into and moving through it. And then as things do start to ease up and heal as they do, and we move into survivorship, then there was a bit of post-traumatic stress syndrome. And then there was, um, <clears throat> You know, it was when I was bald, I would move around in my community and people could see. It was very obvious that I was moving through something and there was a lot of compassion and a lot of support. And in moving into survivorship, it feels a little bit like you're on your own again. And and you would think, I mean, and in some ways it's, wow, I, I moved through that and so I can do anything. And that's true in the sense of what's hard compared to chemo. <laughs> Very few things seem as hard as they used to. But on the other hand, when you've had a diagnosis and you've seen the things that can go wrong and you've felt it physically, emotionally, um, when I go to a doctor's office and I'm taking a test result, I know what I might have to go through if, on the other side of, of bad news. So the fear is still there and that's why the journey continues and it's an ongoing practice. And so that's why my business has evolved as a practice to not to stay ahead of pain or vulnerability or even fear, but as a way to be in it and celebrate even though, right? So and, and then when I'm around women that are still in their treatment journey, or I can see that they've shoved down a lot of the post-traumatic stress and a part of them is just dimmed down or gone because it, they're in pain and they're not wanting to face that. Um, that's, you know, I stay in the space. I stay in that space because there, there's always a, a, it's, there's always an opportunity for creativity and, and celebration, even in the dark places. And it keeps me in that perspective we talked about, that life is a gift. So it's important to me. I've heard you say continuously, either, either directly or indirectly, this idea of having creative command over your life and getting to choose what you create and, and what you bring into your life. Could you speak a little bit more about how you foster that on a day-to-day -day basis now in your life, now that you've recognized this creative power that you have, mm. what do you do to, to bring that into the world and make the most of it? Mm. It's a lot of inquiry. It's a lot of <clears throat> inquiry with um, <clears throat> thoughts and emotions and situations. So I no longer believe everything I think. I kind of want to know what's <laughs> what, what's running this program. You know, yeah, what's really on yeah. the line here. Um, 
is my self-worth on the line? Am I afraid of looking bad? Am I afraid of, there's all these things that as humans, we're ter- like they say that people are more scared of public speaking than death. There's, <laughs> there's some statistic around that. And so I, I'm asking myself all the time, I mean, I have practices, right? I have dedicated to walking in nature many times, um, at multiple times a week at the least. I do have a meditation practice. I do a video journal with myself and I work with others. I have coaches and really wonderful friends and community. I've invested in myself. So all of that is really important. But really looking at moment to moment and day to day, what am what am I afraid of here? And then how can I shift the energy around not to avoid fear but okay fear let's let's do a little dance right and i'm i might even if i don't even if i know i'm in my head i might turn on some music and dance in my kitchen i might just do something audacious like put um you know tattoos on my boobs and <laughs> go, go shake it in the shower <laughs> right like there i it's that it's that laughter because if if things are ever that bad, um, <laughs> they're also that good. I, it, it's a, it's an, again, it's an interesting perspective, but you're right. It's creative command just says I am in charge of my response to things and I might be sobbing and having a breakdown and I might be terrified and I will let that run its course until I can see it for what it is. And, and I might throw some paint or, I, you know, I just, or express myself. Um, it's just, it's just, uh, it's a funny dance and it's a practice. Yeah. Uh, I love what you said right at the beginning there of, of not believing every thought that you have. I think that's such a, a hugely important practice to, to become aware of when, when I'm running some of my seminars, I quite often give this little analogy of I ask people to think of a time that they were so angry, so mad with someone that they thought, oh my God, I could just kill them. And usually the parents in the room in particular can, can resonate <laughs> with that one. And, you know, maybe like a third or a half the room will put their hands up. And so I say, right, for all of you, just put your hands up. You've had this thought that you could kill someone. Put your hands up again if you're a murderer. And of course, everyone mm-hmm. laughs and nobody puts their hands up. Yeah. Well, the reason that that happened is because you recognize that thought was just a stupid thought. You didn't have to put energy into it. You didn't have to pay attention to it. You didn't have to take action based on that thought. And in that ridiculous scenario, we can have a little laugh and recognize how stupid our thoughts are. But some of the things you also mentioned there, thoughts about our worth, our confidence, our ability, we Mm -hmm. have equally ridiculous thoughts about these equally as ungrounded in evidence or reality but we do put power into these thoughts we do put attention to these thoughts we do take action or sometimes even worse take inaction mm. based on these thoughts so i think this practice of monitoring you talked about what's the program behind the thought thinking where's this thought about my self-worth coming from where's this thought about my ability coming from? Where's my thought about how I should react in this situation coming from? I think that's a really, really key point that you brought up there. Yeah. Yes, you're right. You're right. And then to, to watch the thoughts contradict themselves, right? Sometimes yeah. my thoughts want to tell me I'm the, the, the greatest. <laughs> you know? yeah. Sometimes my thoughts tell me I'm better than other people. And I watch that too. Yeah. I watch that too. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's another thing. Um, you know, thoughts of, well, I'm better than everyone. Well, maybe that's an equally ridiculous thought that you should be aware of and think about where that's leading you and, and what actions that leads you to. Um, so there's a there's a kind of positive slant as well. Where you've got to be careful about well, where are these sort of positive, self fulfilling thoughts coming from? Um, and she'll be yeah. putting power into them too. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it, the thing that always, that tends to bring me f- full circle is that we're in it together, right? 
we're all here, part of the human race. We're all subject to same emotions and fears and desires. And I think I spent a long time before a lot of what I, you know, this big transformation, I think I spent a lot of time in perfectionism and maybe even spiritual perfectionism, trying, you know, wanting to be enlightened and have all unconditional love. And I didn't realize the expectations I was putting on myself almost to be subhuman, right? Almost to be to be something so outside of myself. And I wasn't living in my body and I wasn't, I was not standing up for my, it was a lot of, I guess, if you've heard the expression, spiritual bypass and. Oh, I haven't, but that exactly describes something I've observed. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, So I wasn't drawing boundaries around behavior, the way that I was being treated. And I, and so in my heart and in my mind and in my journaling and meditation, things were lovely. But when I was walking through the world, things were very, very dysfunctional and toxic in certain places. And again, I, I, that's where the cancer was a bit of a wake up call too. So I, I enjoy more and more being human, just, you know, (laughs) warts and all, and this concept of self love and, um, and, and yeah, just, all, all the emotions and all the things that we do, there can be a lightness and a humor to it because we're in it together. And I've yet to experience a time where there wasn't someone that I could reach out to or someone, someone's story that I came across that was um, as challenging or much more so than my own. So that interconnectedness is a beautiful thing. And again, it feels like why I don't really believe in a rock bottom anymore, right? Because we're we're here humaning perfectly, <laughs> right? Yeah. So you're now in the position where your your story is an example to other women, and you are now in a position where you can help other women through the same journey and the same challenges and the same struggles that that you had um if we have women who are listening right now who are in that position and they're at some point in this journey that you've been through and and you help people through what are some of the things that you would want to say some words of encouragement advice philosophy anything that comes to mind yeah i would say to in whatever space feels safe and comfortable find somewhere or someone to say things out loud right to share there's so much power in sharing and if you don't have someone in your life and oftentimes when we're moving through this the people closest to us are the farthest away from understanding because because they love us so much, they're really heavily invested in the outcome and they're very emotionally intertwined in the story. And so we might not want to say to them that they're driving us nuts. (laughs) That we just want to be alone or that what we really think about at night is no one's, you know, whatever it is, the things that keep us up. But these, to say them out loud, it's just to bring the light of awareness to it. There's nothing about anyone that needs to be fixed or changed and no one right way for anybody, but to have the grace to, to have a safe container where you can say what's really going on out loud and move through it and maybe have someone come in to help you mediate your thoughts um, and, and the fearful thoughts and to just, reflect you know to hold a mirror up to the strength and 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 the beauty and and the courage that they're that they're as they're moving through this journey there's so much there they might not see in their own power and beauty mm-hmm. yeah so that's that's probably the biggest thing that i would say and then from there in my experience 
the power of sharing, it just grows. You share in one safe container with someone who really understands and someone who can just listen. And then you feel a little bit more comfortable sharing with your loved ones, with people who might be triggered. And then you feel a little bit more comfortable sharing and being yourself openly in your community. And then for me, next thing you know, I'm this self-proclaimed topless goddess and I'm, you know, (laughs) I'm in Hawaii hiring a photographer to take me into this lush tropical environment so that I can take pictures with my tattoo bees on, (laughs) you know, and so it's not that everybody needs to reach this goal of being an exhibitionist or being um, an, a speaker or even sharing their story. It's, it's all a very personal journey. But if you get to the point where you realize that celebration piece, that self-celebration, and you start to have fun with the creativity of making your story your own, taking back control of the narrative a little bit, that is life-changing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and you would also consider your situation a blessing, you know, for, for the gifts that, and the blessings that come from that. Mm-hmm. Alyssa, I'd like to start wrapping up all of these ideas that we've been talking about and, and wrapping up the conversation in general with a couple of final questions. And I say every interview that just because these are the last few questions, don't feel that your answers need to be short or succinct. You've been giving lovely flowing answers so far and deeply thoughtful answers. I'm sure your answers to these questions will be equally as thoughtful. And the first of these questions, and I think you're going to love this question, have so much to say on it based upon some of the things you mentioned already. And the question is, what are you grateful for? Mm. I'm going to say one that's very present to me right now, and it's music. music. Music is such a fun way to change up an energy and to get me out of my head. And I'm grateful for music. I am great so grateful for my daughters and i know that that um sort of goes without saying but when i was in the moments of if this day is my last right in the critical care unit and and for the the few moments that got really scary there along the way um it really was just all about those girls all about those baby girls so i'm i'm really grateful to have them in my life and um and I'm, I'm grateful for gratitude. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm grateful <laughs> That's <to> very meta. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm grateful to be in a conversation of gratitude. So I'm grateful for people like yourself that are continuing this dialogue and sharing it with your audiences. Great. Yeah. You just mentioned your, your daughters there and, and that links very much into the next question. Um, one of the things that I think is hugely important is fostering and cultivating the next generation. Um, we're at a point now where 2019 and the people who have been born into the world just now or, or are very young at the moment, they're going to inherit the 21st century. They're going to see most, if not all of the rest of the 21st century. And it's really these folks who are going to be the leaders and the change makers and are going to decide what this century looks like for humanity. And I'd like you to imagine that you have some of these future leaders with you right now. You've, you've got a five-year-old child and you've got to say something to them that's going to prepare them for the next 80 odd years that is to come for them in their life and, and as humanity and society in, in general. What would you be saying to that five-year-old? Hmm. The first thing that comes to my mind is something that I say to my daughters all the time when they are not on, not having electronics time (laughs) and there's, you know, what, what should we do? What should we do? I always say the same three words. I say, read, write, or color, read, write, or color. (laughs) And, um, I think what it points to is, is create, right? It, Mm -hmm. it, you know, if you, (laughs) If, you've, if you're on an island, you've got nothing. You can 
you can build a hut from the leaves. You know, it's a silly example, but really I believe in making something from nothing. And I believe in a benevolent, abundant universe where there is always an opportunity to play and to make. So practice a garden or, you know, just get, it's that it's this idea. I think it was Einstein, right? That you can't solve a problem from the same mindset or from the same place Mm -hmm. that it started. So shifting the energy to something creative and inspiring and simple, simple beauty. It's in the little things. So I think I would maybe say some of that to a five-year-old read, write, or color. I might just push some crayons across the desk, right? Or <laughs> give them the materials. I think it's, it's innovation, right? Creativity and innovation will help to solve the world's problems, but from a place of hope and joy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And again, we've got another question that I'm sure you have some preparation of, of an answer to. And the question is moving from thinking of childhood and the beginning of life to thinking about the end of life. And you, you mentioned there was a few times where that was a real contemplation for you and you're thinking, well, if this is the end of my life, what does life mean and what do I want to, to pass on? And, you know, luckily for you, your, your last day is going to be much further into the future now than, than possibly it could have been. Um, but for all of us, of course, there is that last day waiting for us. Um, when you finally get to your, your last day, Alyssa, and you look back on your life and the life that you've lived, what legacy do you want to have left during your time on Earth? Mm, laughter, you know, laughter and lightness and you know, it's, it's a bit of the lemons to lemonade, you know, I, I, I will refer to my implants as coconuts and I'll say my coconuts are my canvas for my heart. And so I, you know, I, I lean again to things that I say to my daughters and I, I love that they know that, yeah, mom got breast cancer. So what did she do? She started coloring on her boobs. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, because this, and again, I, I didn't make this up and I don't know who said it, but life is too important to be taken seriously. So I want the, the laughter and the lightness to continue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Playfulness. Well, I think you, you've brought a lot of laughter and, and playfulness to this, this conversation today and, and a lot of deep thinking and philosophy as well, almost what might be considered two extremes for, for some people, but I think they all, they all kind of blend into each other. And for folks who've been listening, who resonate with your story very directly, they've, they've gone through um, a similar experience, or even just for people who've been listening generally and they've enjoyed your, your thoughts about overcoming challenge and, and making the most of life, uh, for these folks who are listening and would like to find out a little bit more about who you are and what you do, where would you direct them to go to be the best place to find out more? I I do have a website and um, my story and the tattoo bees are, everything is available in one place. So there's lots of different invitations there for ways to connect and participate. And my website is alyssaleahi.com. I'm not sure if you'll put a link, I can spell it. I will do. Yeah. Spell it, spell it anyway. And, uh, there's a link in the show notes. So well. it's sure it's a L I S S A L E A H I.com or, um, tattoo B links to the same place. T A T T O O B I E tattoo B.com. So, um, it's a very simple website and hopefully it, um, lets people you know recognize that there is a safe container available to them to share and to engage or they can order tattoo bees for themselves or their friends or loved ones and we are a one-for-one model so for every tattoo bee purchased i donate a tattoo bee to a breast cancer patient 
and we've already given away many, many, many at different events. So um, it's a great way to, to give back and to just share the, the topless goddessness with as many women as we can. Well, this I uh, would just like to mark and appreciate the optimism that you've brought into this conversation today. Um, the warmth, the the courage, the the deep reflection and and wisdom that you've brought today. I've really enjoyed all of these different aspects that have come out of your experience and and your perspective. And I'd like to thank you for bringing that onto the podcast today and, and sharing it with all the lovely folks who are listening. Thank you. Thank you, David. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd appreciate it hugely if you could head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review for the podcast. With your review, please be as honest and detailed as you can be. Because with honest and detailed feedback, that helps me to adapt and grow this podcast to most serve you, the listener. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, then make sure you subscribe to the podcast. That way you aren't going to miss any of the future episodes that we've got lined up for you. Until next time, remember that you are the author of your life. You hold the pen and you can write whatever script you want for yourself. So go out today and write yourself a beautiful story.